Uh, the talk I will, I am about to give is, in a certain sense, a translation of the systematic theoretical conflict between Kelvin and Schmidt in an iconographical program. And um, the iconographical program I will show you is going to be kind of a slideshow, so I hope it's not going to be too um, quick, but um, <coughs> uh, I would start, or <coughs> let's say, um, what am I going to talk about? It's about the role of the Constitution in the process of imagining the body politic. More precisely, it deals with the place of the written text within the symbolic ensemble of political representation. The underlying assumption of my argument is that if we want to understand the visual politics of constitutionalism, we have to consider first what has preceded it. Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan is marking a turning point of representing the political order. It still reflects the symbolic universe of royal sovereignty and at the same time abandons it for the sake of the contract between the individual subjects. The crucial issue is that, however, the law itself is not present as a written document or a written constitution. We could talk a lot about this iconographic program here of, of Hobbes and of the means of power and of the way the contract is represented, but the contract itself as a written kind of document, the written law is not present. I mean, we could speculate now what is behind, behind, uh, behind the curtain, of course, you know, in the middle of the, of the image, but that would be uh, pure speculation um, to think or to attend um, something like a written law behind it. We, um, we just don't know. So the, Hobbes, the Hobbesian imaginary of the Leviathan is marked by the curious absence of the law as a written text. What is rendered visible is the means of power. Um, I will argue that this is one of the main differences of the Hobbes imaginary, not only with American constitutionalism, but even more so with the French example that I will um, come to in a minute. So, in a Leviathan, the law is absent as a symbolic unity. The constitution of the body politic is created by pact, but for Hobbes, it does not necessarily require a written form. This might be surprising, given his definition of a law that d distinguishes unwritten law from written law. So, if you look it up in the uh, Leviathan, there's a whole chapter on it, chapter 14. Um, but um, this is a misleading distinction made up by, by Hobbes because natural law, in his perspective, is unwritten. Positive law is written in the sense that it is the product of a sovereign. Hobbes, but the thing is Hobbes uses written here in a metaphorical, not in a literal sense, meaning only the fact of being artificial products. They are different from nature because they are made by political will. The written law does not have to be written in a document or a text. That's what Hobbes says. It can as well be <coughs> spoken or verbally pronounced, um, but the importance is merely the fact of being heard in public. So um, for Hobbes, the law takes shape in, as he says, signs of the will, reduced to the will of the sovereign. Um, so meaning that the forms of the signs are contingent, um, only have to be the will of the sovereign. For Hobbes, the written form has even to be considered as a problem, since words are always ambiguous in their meaning and thus may be interpreted differently. The importance for Hobbes is that the sovereign does not only have the monopoly to transform his will into the binding obligation for every citizen, the sovereign also claims the authority to fix the meaning of the legal act and thus to avoid confusion about his true intention. He is at the same time the source of the will, the power of legislation, and the power of interpretation. The fact that Hobbes did attribute only little importance to the written character of the law might not be surprising in the historical context of the common law tradition. You could say, after all, he is English, so um, he doesn't have much interest in a written constitution, even though there is a whole body of written documents. Um, but um, anyway, um, but at the same time, one of his most critical authors um, towards the Leviathan, James Harrington did conceive the fundamental law of the body politic as a written constitution, a document that would fix for all citizens and a magistrate 
the content of the Commonwealth in a subsequent set of orders of very different kind compared to those of Hobbes. So Hobbes' orders is the will of the sovereign. Um, Herod's orders is really the structure of the constitution that he lays out um, in his uh, major work, Oceana, um, that is the example of the first written constitutional draft in the history of, of ideas, according to Alois Riegle. So, and it is also expressed in his famous definition of government, which is, according to Harrington, the empire of laws, not of men. It demonstrates that the idea of the constitution in the form of a written document was not completely absent from the horizon of political thought at that time, and even took the quality of a republican counter-concept against notions as, I quote, the laws of this kingdom, his majesty's laws, the laws of the land, etc., um, there's a, a very nice article of uh, Gerhard Sturz who um, analyzes this. Um, Hobbes Leviathan is not primarily concerned with the constitution of the body politic, but rather with the enforcement of the law. For this reason, the law as written text, as material document, is absent from the frontispiece and thus from the major visual symbolization of sovereign statehood at the beginning of modern political thought. I mean, this is not any kind of picture here. This is really um, a very central uh, iconographic um, uh, statement. So, for Hobbes, the constitution of the political is readable only in a negative sense, which is the consequence to be drawn from the law of nature. The founding act of the political machine does not have, not have to be the written down. Such a document would only impose limitations on the sovereign and by opening the doors to different interpretation of the written text, empower acts of opposition and rebellion. Now, mm, to impose the contract that creates the Leviathan, Hobbes sees the necessity to represent the sovereign as personalized, artificial god, an example of political robotics serving only one purpose of securing the lives of its creators and protect them from each other's bad nature. It is against this image of undivided personalized power that the revolutions in the late 18th century create not only a different setting of participation and political representation, but also a different iconological program that is directly opposed to the Hobbesian picture of modern statehood. The revolution overthrows not only the way political power is legitimized and how it is molded into an institutional form, it was also translated into um, a new visual frame to represent the key ideas of a new political regime. In order to show the conflict between the different modes of representing the political order, I will focus on the French example and its frequent change of regimes. In this process of transformation, one can focus the relation of the new constitution and its personalization. From the very beginning, the revolution creates an iconology of impersonal power that may still include the king as representative figure, but that is radically anti-royal in character, since it breaks the monopoly of personal representation of the nation by the king and puts a new symbolic language in place. In breaking up the traditional imaginary of personalized sovereignty, the revolution is not only creates numerous allegorical bodies and stages the revolutionary ideas as tableau vivant, etc., featuring the goddess of freedom, the republic, the nation, the people, and so on in various settings. Next, to all these new bodies enriching and transforming the political scenery, it is the constitution itself that is visualized as the source of impersonal power and legitimacy. The Republican anti-personalization becomes evident in a symbolic representation of the body politic as written constitution. In a general sense, the political symbolization of writing and its relation to the political body is one of the core elements of the revolutionary uh, iconology. And one of the major examples you can see here, even though it's not a text of the constitution, but what you, hear, what you see here is the death of the person and the permanence of the text, um, which is um, 
a topos that I will um, uh, elaborate on in, in a second. The key to this imagination is the question how to transform the political will into a steady political form of transcending personal rule in the written law. The answer is widely perceived as being the process of drafting a constitution, of transforming the political will into a legal text. It is by this process that the ephemeral moment of unity can be transformed into a mutual obligation to establish a political commonwealth. And this idea is expressed in the image of David, not the one you just saw, but this one that um, Professor Gebhardt has already shown, uh, Le Serment du Jeu du Pont, from 1789. The center of the picture, now this is the, the interesting thing. Um, I think what this picture is about is exactly the moment of the transformation of the political will in a text. So it has both dimensions, personal representation of the bodies and the symbolic dimension of the, um, of the text. Because what is at the core of the picture, uh, I'm afraid you will have to believe me because it's too small to be seen, but what is at the core of the picture? It's not the, the, the hand of the, of the oath. What is at the core is, is this little piece of paper that he holds in his hand this little piece of paper that, in a certain sense, collects the political energy of the political will that is present in this kind of uh, moment, but that is eph ephemeral. You know, it, it's one one hour later, it's gone, or the next day, it's you know. But uh, what what is being represented here, in a symbolic sense, is the idea of um, synthesizing the political will, and transforming it into um, a legal text. So. It's the transition of authority from the personal bodies of the representatives to the impersonal text of the Constitution. And um, as a consequence, the written text becomes now the symbolic foundation of the new political body. I mean, this one you all know and you have seen it before, but um, I think one has to underline that this is the most radical counter image to the Leviathan. I mean, uh, no. There is still there. Persons are present, but it's still only allegorical <coughs> presence. It's the um, allegory of uh, French nation and of liberty. Um, and this one breaks the image of personali personalizing the body politic and thus suggests a different way of thinking about political unity. It is important to notice, however, that the means of creating and enforcing political obligations of the law the one that are so central to the Hobbes Leviathan um, in its different uh, kind of variations, um, they are still present here. You know, uh, there's the, the Fasces in the middle, which is the, um, uh, you know, the common symbol of, uh, of, of uh, a political uh, authority of the magistrate and of the enforcement of the law. But during the first period of the revolution until 1700, uh, 1793, there are numerous examples of uh, numerous ex examples which illustrate, illustrate how the new text-based constitution replaces the royal personalization of the Ancien Regime. In the iconology, of, um, in the, iconology the force of the constitution is more and more autonomous compared to the king and becomes transformed in a personalized allegory itself. What you see here is the is la constitution, this constitution put on the uh, on the pedestal. Right? Um, so uh, it takes the shape of uh, the goddess of liberty, and both have now at this point become virtually indistinguishable. And after the decapitation of uh, Louis XVI, the scenario has changed towards a pure hegemony of the text. But after the absence of the king, new personal embodiments enter in a battle of symbolization, struggling for the successful incarnation of the people. And it's mostly the Jacobin discourse that creates a situation of a double bind, one could say, referring at the one hand to the sacred text, with the words of Saint-Just to, uh, to the constitution as sacred image of liberty, l'image sacrée de la liberté. Um, and I mean, here you have the tables of Moses without Moses, of course, because it's, it's only the text. 
Um, on the other hand, however, uh, there is a repersonalization of the discourse of political obligation by founding it of the idea of an immediate incorporation in a sort of corpus mysticum in a Republican um, uh, Jacobin discourse that uh, tries to realize the unity between the orator, the, re the rhetoric, and, and, and the people by really creating an immediate kind of bond between the people and its incorporation um, without referring um, that much to the Constitution. But it can be assumed that it is this discourse which prepares the marginalized or the marginalization of the written Constitution, the Jacobin discourse, which preparizes, uh, prepares the marginalization of the written constitution in the revolutionary imagery and prepares the return of the personal body to incorporate the democratic legitimacy. The belief in the transcendent character of the written constitution has ceded its power to the repersonalization of politics. The self-coronation of Napoleon in 1804 marks a clear break with the revolutionary worship of the constitution. But while returning to a traditional visualization at the first glance, it could not be more distant in its narrative of the self-crowned emperor um, that steps up to, to accomplish the revolution. I mean, um, this is no more the ancient monarchical kind of, uh, uh, of expression. This is totally different because it's uh, Napoleon himself who puts, uh, who puts up the, uh, the crown on his head. So. But anyhow, the legal constitution as a text becomes now invisible behind the personal ruler who again embodies the political constitution of the people in an act of symbolic representation. Now, um, after, after on in the 19th century, um, uh, after, the, uh, after Napoleon, it, um, there is some development that one can describe as the body as a text, where before you have the text um, um, as uh, you have the body without the text and the text without the body. Now you have the body as a text in the sense that the monarch becomes a constitutional fiction. It is after the end of the empire that the written constitution, the written constitution returns on the stage of symbolic representation. The restored monarchy under uh, Louis the um, 18 sees itself in a situation where it cannot resign <laughs> from the legitimacy of a written, written document. The Constitutional Charter of 1814 bears the sign of a mere gift of the king given to his subjects, what you see here on this medal there, um, and thus stands in a shadow. But it becomes quite clear that the royal representation of the body politic has lost its foundation. The body of the king is not sufficient anymore to claim authoritative power. It is literally, literally, what you see here is literally overwritten with the text of the Constitution. Well, this is, uh, 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 this is uh, Louis XVIII, and this is Le Roi et la Charte, and when you see this, uh, uh, this uh, little part, it starts with uh, la Charte Constitutionnelle. The whole Constitution is the head of the king. It's the king as a text. So, um, the superposition of writing and body here has ultimately become so consolidated in a common imagination that even the re reactionary attack on the constitution by Charles X, who at the end of the 20s uh, in, in uh, this period has tried to restore royal authority without limitations of you know, liberal kind of uh, um, constitutional things, but it, it's bound to fail. It is not possible to go back behind the written form and to emancipate the king from the text of the constitution. The picture here demonstrates this in a twofold manner. I mean, at the one hand, he's trying, you know, stomping on the symbols of justice there, there's the constitution and everything. And uh, you know that uh, the, the title of the picture in French has a double meaning. Quel saut means what a, what a jump, what a stump, but in the same sense, it means uh, what an idiot. Because so S O T is uh, is, uh, well. um, but this is only one dimension. The other dimension, I think, uh, even more striking is that um, the king literally seems to spring up from the book of the constitution, but his attempt to liberate himself from its paper origin must fail, since as a king he cannot exist beyond the written constitutional text. 
<coughs> from a personal source of power and authority, he has been transformed into a fictional character, an artificial creation of the Constitution. He doesn't incarnate the Constitution, he has become indistinguishable from the constitutional text. With the revolution of 1830 and under the July monarchy, this de development continues. It presents the new regime as a connection of constitutional document with the body of the king. So here's Louis Philippe, hence being no more the king of France, but again king of the French, and was reduced to the head and the frame of the constitutional document. Um, and they put a National Guard and a soldier next to him to ensure that uh, the memory of the constitutional moments and its revolutionary power is not forgotten. The representation of the head of states in the constitutional monarchies and beyond uh, mirrors this new constellation quite clearly. Louis XVIII has introduced the new foundation of his legitimacy in his official portrait in a barely visible manner. I mean, here you have the imagination that everything is as before, you know, this is like at times of Louis XIV, etc. But it's not. Because here as well, you have to believe me, because I'm telling you, um, the regalia here, they are put on the constitutional text. What you see here is the constitution as a document. It's lying on this, on this big uh, uh, box here. And it is based on the foundation of the constitution. So a tiny little detail, barely visible, that totally breaks apart the traditional imaginary and the symbolic representation of the royal um, order. You know, it's breaking into pieces. Um, and the same thing here with Louis Philippe there, it has become more visible, it's leather bound, you know, more solid, more, uh, more clearly. And here, Louis Napoleon is, uh, is president, he is still is the president of the Second Republic, he's becoming a mere illustration of the text of the Constitution. You know, nice picture to have, but the important thing is the text. Um, but then, the attempt to tame the president and to depersonalize the sovereign has failed again. This is the same person, no more president of the Republic, but uh, Empereur Napoleon III. And, and this is, you know, you just changed the face, but this is like uh, Louis XIV. You know, this is the same kind of um, symbolic image. No text, no law, no constitution, only the body representing the new legitimacy of the order. Um, it has then, we have to wait until um, the, uh, uh, um, the Third Republic when we have a certain taming of the body and the president as, in a certain sense, the first citizen. Um, it is Adolf Thiers, who is the first president of the uh, Third Republic, um, who marks a clear break again, displaying certain rationalized modernity, progress, science, and a civilized approach, leaving all feudal ornament behind, because he's the first one to choose a black and white photography um, as the official portrait, which is, I mean, for, for now, today, it's, it seems obvious, but at the time it was really a very new thing. Um, and then, which, which goes on with the other, other pre presidents, and um, um, anyway, there is, um, <coughs> Um, there's a very particular sober character of, the, um, of those portraits, reflecting in a certain sense the uh, sober character of the constitutional laws in the Third Republic as well, um, and the very weak position of the head of state in this kind of constitution, uh, where it seems to be no real need to counterbalance the personal charisma with legal symbolism. Because, I mean, at the core of this, the representation of the order, anyhow, is the republic, the nation, and all um, the um, uh, visual, um, uh, visual language and the semantics that come with it. But it's not until Charles de Gaulle becomes the founder of the Fifth Republic and the new president in 58 that the Constitution returns to its place in balancing personal power. Um, on the, one of the first examples of color photography, um, it is, this is the Constitution here. Um, so the Constitution once again becomes identifiable as being not identical with the personal body of the President. It marks a permanent difference <coughs> between both. It is a striking detail of the arrangement that the, uh, the Constitution is not the only book. Um, and this one here is the copy of uh, Jure Renaud, La Légion d'Honneur. 
Um, now, you may ask yourself, uh, this is resemblance to the, uh, uh, more to uh, the tradition of the uh, constitutional monarchy than to the, to the republic. And um, you're right. I mean, you may even think of, uh, you know, Bonapartism as, as a political tradition represented here, but there's no Napoleon here. I mean, as, unless you, but in fact there is, because if you, if you open up this book here, and you know that Napoleon is the founder of the uh, Légion d'Honneur. Um, there is there is a, a hidden Napoleon in this picture um, because uh, if you open up this one, the first thing you see is a facsimile of um, the uh, two facsimiles, in fact, of the founder of the Légion d'Honneur, which is no one less than Napoleon. So, um, <clears throat> and there's a, there's a, there's another another uh, hint that I would like to point out uh, when we compare this one to the Leviathan. And I talked about uh, the absence of the law, but the presence of the means of power to enforce the law. Now, um, the Leviathan, is, it, is, it is the sovereign who incorporates the monopoly of, 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 uh, of, of violence. Um, but um, here, it is interestingly enough, not the concentration of force in the hands of the sovereign, but it's, it's a Republican theme. It's a Republican theme because what we have here these are the armes d'honneur. This is the, the second table, uh, uh, what you have in this picture, because it's the, it's the Légion d'honneur. It's, it's the incorporation of, of civic military virtue of defending the Constitution. Um, that is the whole idea what the Légion d'honneur is about, and it is uh, rendered uh, visible here in this, in this volume, so the will to fight for the Republic, um, etc., etc. Now, to come to a conclusion, um, I would like to um, add some, uh, some general remarks um, on constitutional images um, and, um, and this is now, now this is a mere illustration but not merely because um, I don't know if you, if you know this one, this is a very nice example of Francois Schein, is a Belgian artist who, um, who designed or who, um, yeah, who designed the, uh, uh, the metro station uh, Place de la Concorde. And it's a declaration, the, 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 the Declaration des Droits de, de l'Homme et du Citoyen, which as a text fills the whole station, you know, it's, uh, so rendered in stone here, in stone tiles. And uh, now you may ask yourself, why is it not Assemblée Nationale or Station Élysée? No, it's Concorde. And for a reason, because Place de la Concorde was the place where, uh, uh, where the king was decapitated. You know? So here you have, it's if you want to like to say, it's, it's under the guillotine uh, where you have uh, again the re-emergence of the pure text of the constitution if you take this um, declaration as, as being um, in, uh, uh, as being as a substitute for this one here um, but um, so anyway, I think to conclude two points the first point is that a written constitution or written constitutions are not merely legal text but always embedded in a political and cultural context that may or may not enforce the validity and the power of the legal norm by supporting it with a strong notion of the written word as expression of a higher rationality, a cultural presumption of the superiority of scripture over other forms of cultural expressions. But the paradox being, of course, that the fact that this relation and this superiority of scripture or of literality being expressed not only in literality itself but in a visual manner that exposes the written constitution in a highly visible way, way and that approves the written legal content by transcending it, it visually by transforming it into a picture. So this is the one point. And the second point is that the written constitution, however, is almost never the only form of representing the constitution of the body politic. It is embedded in a multitude of various concurring cultural forms, the most important of which I have tried to demonstrate here may probably be the personal incarnation of the political order, um, inherited from the pre-modern times where the king could be identified as permanent symbol of unity. But of course there are others, I mean, the nation, the people, the state, the republic, 
And now, I mean, the market is, is another form. Uh, you know, God is a different, for, for one might be the same, but anyway. Um, uh, so these are concurring kind of images of, of, of semantics of unity, of visualizations of unity, where you have to analyze the constitution of um, uh, taking place in this kind of um, context. So modern constitutions are trying to break this unity of incarnation by substituting it with a logic of difference, of non-identity between the power and its representatives. With the symbol of the written constitution, the body politic is transformed from being identical with itself towards being in a permanent quest for itself. The meaning of the written constitution is never finally fixed, but is in need of an ongoing process of interpretation. I mean, we have uh, constitutional judges present here. They uh, surely know what, uh, what this is about. The repersonal repersonalization of the political that we may witness in these days, so be it in the form of you know, polytainment or be it in the form, more dangerous form, of the neoclassical authoritarianism uh, that we uh, witness today, these forms may eventually signal a resurgent demand for symbols of, for sheer unity. But the clear distinction of the attempt to fully grasp the unity of the people within one personalized body or on the other hand, and the political order where the difference between concurring images of the constitution is kept alive, as one could say, is separation of powers in the sphere of symbolic resources of legitimacy, such a separation of powers does become one of the most important tasks for the political re reflection of today. And I thank you for your attention.